you just mentioned something interesting there, of course, when we were talking about the Kigali Innovation City and, of course, uh, looking at the Africa 50 that you signed a deal with. We're looking about $400 million to be invested into this particular one. Kindly break it down in a rather very understandable way or a lame man uh, understanding. Uh, what does this entail? So it's also important that I clarify that the $400 million mm -hmm. is not the total cost of what it takes to put in place the real estate infrastructure for the Kigali Innovation City. Um, How much does it take? It would take close to $2 billion, I mean, uh, two right. billion uh, US dollars. But uh, what we did is we've already done um, a financial modeling for the Kigali Innovation City to say, how do we create a work, live, and play environment within the Kigali Innovation City? And uh, Africa 50 um, came to us and said, we want to contribute to this. We won't be, we, and these are some of the portions where we're looking to invest. And so what they've picked out is to say, we want to set up the digital innovation present. In layman language, it's office buildings mm -hmm. for all these companies that are either looking to, especially for companies that are not looking to build, but are just looking for a place to lease or rent. Um, the other component that comes under the 400 million is uh, student housing. Um, as you might be aware, right now we already have the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Africa has already uh, built their campus there. Uh, the Africa Institute for Mathematical Sciences is going to be building a, a campus there. Uh, the Africa Leadership Academy is also building yeah, a campus right. there. So what you see is a mm -hmm. large student community that is still going to need um, housing and accommodation within the vicinity of their campuses to make it easy for them to, you know, to, to, to move across uh, the ecosystem. And so they picked up the student housing facility as one, area, one element that they were uh, interested in. And of course, another element that, besides the student housing, we're also looking at residentials. You're going to have a community of workers within these companies that are going to be established within the Kigali Innovation City. Right. And so they want to take that. And the last component that they're looking at is to build a hotel for people that are coming in and going that don't need uh, long-term uh, you know, rental spaces or, or leasing spaces. And so these are the four components that Africa 50 is really focused on to go out and raise both equity. It's going to be a mix of equity and debt financing to finance those components. All right. Now, of course, we know there are some similar projects that we've seen, like Tech Hub, the Tech Hub in uh, Pram Pram in Ghana. We've seen one uh, Konza Techno City in Kenya. Yes. But they really never had to serve up to the expectations, you know, never materialized, if you put it in another term. Why should we be hopeful for the Kigali Innovation City to actually be a reality? Look, look at it this way. In fact, beyond the two that you've mentioned, we have mm. about nine different technology hubs across the continent, mm. all who, whose sole purpose and objective is to, is to position their countries as innovation hubs for the continent. But when we were doing the financial modeling, of course, that was a question that we really had to consider and say, what is it that we're going to do different? Excellent. And how do we ensure that this actually happens? And so for Rwanda, what we did was to say, what is our competitive advantage? Uh, taking into consideration this, uh, the small size of a market that we have, taking into consideration that we're a landlocked country. These are challenges that we cannot, you know, we, we have little room to change. And so what we decided to do was to say, can we become a proof of concept hub? And what that means is how do we become the, the economy that attracts all uh, innovators across the continent that are looking for a place to come and test, innovate, and try their solutions, and then use Rwanda as a springboard as they launch to the rest of the continent. So what that helps us is that we're building R&D capabilities within the economy. Mm -hmm. But also we're not oblivious to the fact that we just have a market of 12 million. And so how do we create those kind of innovative companies, innovation-driven enterprises that are looking to a regional and continental market? That's one. The second thing was to say, when you look at ICT, it's broad. Mm -hmm. What are some of those industries where we have key strength that we can leverage on to say this is, this is where we're going to build capabilities and then we and over time as we create more capabilities we then venture into other industries and so that meant that we needed to narrow down we couldn't do everything ICT we had to narrow down based on what are the capabilities what are the strengths that we have and so we've been looking at a couple of industries and that one of them has been fintech um, the other one has been agritech we've looked at biotech we've looked at uh, digital healthcare and and most of these really they we have very sound, uh, we've built sound assumptions into the models, but also to say, 
something like digital healthcare. If we already have health coverage for the biggest number of our population, over 90%, mm -hmm. that is already a strength that we can leverage to then say, how do we create digital solutions that make access uh, to healthcare and quality healthcare achievable? And so these are some of the things. But I think, even broadly speaking, uh, if you had to compare us against uh, the different governments, I think given the leadership that we have as a government, given the sense of urgency that we have, I mean, given our history, we cannot afford to feel like we have you know, a lot of time ahead to always play the catch-up game. I think that sense of we need to be ahead of the curve right. is already there. And then the other thing that helps us is that because we've been building everything from scratch, mm -hmm. we are not held down by legacy infrastructure and systems, which makes it really easy for us to move ahead so fast compared to the other uh, countries that are grappling with challenges that are really around legacy systems and that, that they can't overcome easily. Paula, you've mentioned uh, interesting things here. Of course, you've uh, touched agri-tech. We also understand that agriculture is uh, literally the backbone of this country's economy. However much we talk about moving to uh, technology and the knowledge base, currently, if you look at it, uh, ICT only contributes about 3% of the country's GDP. So going back to that, uh, the agri-tech, uh, we can give so many examples of uh, people that have been really innovative in this space. Uh, the likes of uh, BK Tech House with uh, their innovation with the robotics and all of this. But coming back to also that, even with the digital health, we've seen co companies like Babel set up in Rwanda also working closely to solving a particular uh, issue. Yes. Yeah. But talk to me now, have these actually had a significant contribution yet? So it's good that you raised that point. So even if I just speak up from there and then continue, it's a lot of these companies, the, the significant contribution hasn't yet been felt All right. because they haven't scaled. If you just take an example of Babil, I think they have you know, just a few people that they've been working with. And right now, actually, as government, we're trying to work with them to say, now that you've tested your solution, now that we know that it works, now that we understand the benefits of using uh, this um, you know, digital healthcare solution, how can we work with you to scale it to the rest of the population? Mm. Once we do that, once we scale beyond, um, beyond prototyping and testing, I think that's when we start to see you know, tangible contribution towards GDP. The current 3% that you talk about is really measured purely based on what the telecommunications sector is contributing towards GDP. And now what we're increasingly starting to say, how do we support the indigenous, existing indigenous companies so that we help them to scale in a way that they're able to contribute in tangible ways to, uh, to, to, to our GDP? How do we attract more ICT investments that really have a direct correlation and, and a way of, of measuring how they contribute towards um, I, the GDP? But also how do we, because ICT is an enabler. So if we continue to look at it as a specific industry where you're just looking at telecom and how much it, it contributes to GDP, it's going to be difficult to then measure how else you know, this enabler is supporting these other sectors to contribute towards GDP. And very, you, I think over the next one or two years, you're going to see a change in how we measure the ICT contribution to GDP from just the traditional ICT industry, but also the enabling effect that it has in other industries. Mm. I've always wanted to sit down with you to ask you a question about uh, startup houses. We definitely understand that startups, of course, with SMEs, small and medium enterprises, today in Africa, they contribute about 77% of uh, the jobs created on the market. We've seen a couple of them uh, set up uh, in Kigali. We've seen startup houses being uh, constructed all around. But has the government any plans to actually back them up? The, the short answer to that is yes. And the I'll go a bit into it. <laughs> <laughs> and the long answer to that is, yeah. So when we started thinking about um, KIC and shaping the vision of KIC and what we really wanted to do. Mm. Um, we were like, fine, we want to build an innovation ecosystem, but what does that mean in real terms? And how do we build off existing initiatives that, that are not just uh, government backed, but are also you know, interventions from the private sector and people that are passionate about tech and the role of tech in, in, in really growing the economy. And um, one of the things, of course, as, as, as a first step was to say, okay, we have all these startup houses. What is it that can, government can do to support them? What are the challenges that they are facing that they can't unlock on their own, given how long they've been uh, in, the, in the economy? What comes really top of the challenges that they'll talk about is um, 
financing. They'll also talk about uh, talent, not being able to, and I mean, if you go to many of these meetings, they'll tell you talent. We don't have the, the quality of talent. We might have the numbers, even the numbers are not enough, given our vision of becoming an innovation hub How, for the yeah. continent. Mm -hmm. But even starting from the, you know, the bigger challenge, which is quality, because this is what the companies are looking for. So what we've done uh, as a government is to set up a technical assistance fund, which we're going to launch uh, early next year. And the idea of the Technical Assistance Fund is to say, what capabilities, what kind of financing do you require for most of these startup hubs? Because if you look at something like K-Lab, what they provide is space, internet connectivity, and a group of mentors. But beyond that, for them to scale, they really need a bit of, you know, some seed financing that helps them to really start prototyping their solutions, testing what, if, the, if they're acceptable on the market. And so these are some of the things we've been looking into. And early next year, uh, we're, you're going to see, we've already started designing uh, technical assistance programs that one are focused on what kind of capabilities do these companies require? Mm -hmm. What kind of financing do they require? But also targeting companies that are beyond the startup phase. Mm -hmm. Because as we start to attract VC into the economy, you need to make sure that the media, the companies that are that are beyond, because you have seed stage and early growth. Mm. So those that are beyond early growth, that are getting into expansion, you want to say, how do we support you to become investment ready? So that when a VC firm comes, All right. you're able to be a recipient of what they're providing. So with this, you're saying you're looking at a venture capitalists or the government with the venture capitalists to actually step in? We've already done that through the Rwanda Innovation Fund. Right. We've created the Rwanda Innovation Fund with a venture capital firm where government has put in 30, $30 million, which is really 30% of the total $100 million. And this private firm is bringing in uh, $70 million. But for a start, because the fund has to start next year, we've asked them to match what government has put in place, the $30 million. And they've been able to secure $30 million. Mm -hmm. So they're going to start off with a $60 million fund. But this is a venture firm that is pretty much going to be looking at you know, more established companies that are looking to expand, that are going beyond the uh, early growth stages. And so what we are doing is how do we create a pipeline of companies within the country that can tap into this financing? Because with a venture capital uh, fund, they're going to have a set of criteria. This is what you need to fulfill to be able to benefit from this fund. Mm -hmm. So our role as government is how do we create that pipeline? How do we build that pipeline? How do we make them investment ready so that when this fund starts to uh, get into operation, mm -hmm. they can become among the first cohort of recipients of this financing? All right. Uh, one, one, one can sit back and uh, say that Rwanda is very ambitious and we've actually hit a lot of targets set. But uh, if this uh, rather becoming the regional ICT hub or Africa's high city hub actually happen, we expect to see big tech companies like maybe say Google, Facebook, Microsoft, all of this are running to come to Rwanda, right? How, yeah, actually Netflix just signed. You yes, know, yes, so sorry. let's uh, rush into this conversation and look at it uh, broadly. Have we any set of regulations, framework that has been put aside to actually protect the minority, the small investors in Rwanda? Because, yes, we're all excited when we hear such big names coming into the country, okay. but then as a small uh, tech developer, as someone that is trying to also have, you know, uh, part of the market share have we any sort of regulations in place? So let me step back a little bit and, and, and talk about some of the things that we're doing. So yes, I know when one, one wants to build an innovation hub, the very first thing everyone is thinking, how do we bring Microsoft, Google, Facebook? Because they're huge. Mm -hmm. They're huge. And we need them. We need them in the economy if they're mm -hmm. coming to address a problem that we have. We definitely need them. All right. However, we are also very aware that we also need to create our own likes that will become the first books of you know, 2050, 2040. And so it's a balance. You have to balance between how do you bring in these global companies to come and build synergies with your local companies in a way that you're able to support growth of unicorns that eventually will be you know, the big companies that really are making a difference across the continent and, and, uh, and in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, back to your question about what are we doing? I mean, there are a couple of interventions, and, and, and I can't say it's enough. It's, it's always work in progress. There's, there's room to do more. Mm. But currently, if you just look from the regulatory perspective, we, we're starting to see more and more uh, the regulators putting in place regulatory sandboxes. 
that allow for our local companies to prototype their solutions and test them in an environment that is free of the different regulations that we have. So that when it's time to scale, at mm. least you've given them an opportunity to test this with, with limited barriers mm. uh, to innovate. That's one. The other thing that we're looking to do is, um, when, as a government, when you look at some of our procurement processes, uh, they're very heavily focused on how much experience do you have? Have you done this elsewhere? You know, these kind of things. And naturally, when you put out a tender, the local companies will probably not be, you know, they'll not have, they'll not be on the same level playing field mm -hmm. with international companies or multinational companies that come in and they've provided an almost similar solution in Ghana or Kenya. And mm -hmm. so they're coming here because they've done that and that's a reference point, so they get more advantage. So what we're trying to do as a ministry uh, of ICT and innovation is to say, how can we put in place pro-innovation policies right. that encourage uh, procuring for innovation? So you're not just looking for experience and reference, but you're creating, putting in place uh, uh, methods, whether it's design competitions, whether it's curving out and saying, for this particular system, we're not necessarily looking for a tested solution elsewhere. We just want to see what the market can provide us, and we okay. can fine tune it along the way. Mm -hmm. And this is really a way to say that we're protecting the local ecosystem, okay. uh, industry ecosystem, to say, let's give you a platform mm -hmm. to come and provide these solutions. For some of these things, you really don't need um, you know, solutions that have been done elsewhere. You just need to test the capabilities you have within the industry and also help them to build their capabilities. And maybe even the solutions that have been done anywhere no, might not necessarily step in for the African solutions that They're we need. They're not always a great fit. Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once you fit all is not uh, yeah. the best way to go. But uh, a follow-up on uh, that, rather, the ambitions that we've seen and Rwanda hit a lot of them. But we saw the one laptop per child coming through and it phased out. We don't necessarily know what happened to it. Uh, E-learning, also something very, very interesting, uh, screens in schools and children learning from uh, a, a student-centered basis and uh, having laptops and all this. Positivo also came through uh, with this. We expected they were to start churning out uh, laptops to college students. All of this, where did it go? What happened to it? It's still, it's, it's still happening. So one laptop per child initially was designed for primary school students. Mm -hmm. And every, every one of these initiatives that we've gone through as a government, there's been some learning lessons and experiences throughout the process. And that has really fed into how we design other, uh, you know, other programs. But like you said, really the intention was how do we improve the learning experience for students? Mm -hmm. How do we improve the quality of education? But also how do we make sure that we are churning out um, uh, students or graduates that are really competitive at an international scale? Mm -hmm. And so looking at e-learning, it became a de facto uh, you know, uh, intervention that helps us to say, how do we you know, create content from across the world and make sure our students have access to this? Now what happened with the one laptop per child was that yes, we, we provided devices, but um, we, we didn't provide uh, you know, the content as quick as possible, and that's why it didn't really pick up as had been anticipated. But at least exposing primary school students to these gadgets already sort of like seeded a desire for them to start to play with these devices and see what they can do. So when we brought in Positivo, the idea was how do we build off the one laptop per child initiative, mm -hmm. but also build off it with you know embedding some of the lessons learned into it. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, Positivo when it started off, it didn't start off with uh, you know great results because initially when we designed the the Positivo agreement, it was really meant for um, primary school students and secondary school students. But after we entered into that agreement and the plant started assembling these uh, devices, then there was a an appetite from higher learning institutions to have access to the same number of devices, which were quickly provided, but in a very short time we realized that the specifications of these devices weren't exactly a good fit for uh, higher learning students because the, the, the needs and, and the computing power that they need and what the, and the applications really could not run with this kind of device. Mm -hmm. And we scaled back on, on, on distributing them because we're like, we don't want to really affect the learning experience because we've seen a need and quickly want to address the need with existing devices. Let's think of creating devices that are very specific to, uh, to these higher learning uh, you know, institutions. 
About three to four weeks ago is when we launched the program to distribute in higher learning institutions. And what we did was we, re, we went back to the plant, gave them new specifications that were fit for higher learning uh, education students, but also the kind of laptop that if I'm out of school, I can even use in my workplace. And so that's what we did. And we've already started distributing. We had about 14,000. We've distributed close to 10,000. Hoping over the next two weeks we can clear out uh, and give as many students as we can. Again, that's not enough. Because now what we're realizing is, yes, we put the devices in their hands. Mm -hmm. We now need to think about um, e-content. How do we uh, digitize the curriculum? How do we create, uh, you know, uh, provide content online and make sure that, you know, you're not giving them just a device, but they don't have the content. Because mm -hmm. then it beats the whole purpose, and then we, still, we, we fail to see the benefits. And so we've been working with the Minister of Education and the Rwanda Education Board and, HIA and HEC to say, what programs can we quickly put in place together with our local industry to digitize all the content that we have, not just the curriculum, but all the content that we have, mm -hmm. so that students can start to access um, you know, uh, this content using these devices. Of course, the other thing that we need to look up is how do we build capabilities so that you're not just giving someone a computer, but you're also going through the process of them learning how to use a computer, access the content, and all these things. So these are interventions that um, the Ministry of Education is going to be working with us over the next financial year to make sure that we digitize all the content and the learning material for students. Let me to draw you back just a little bit. This year we saw Andela coming into Rwanda and of course uh, uh, hoping to churn out about 600 plus software developers. Uh, I'll bring back BK Tech House. I love speaking about BK Tech House because, well, they've uh, definitely done something with uh, the young uh, people, uh, secondary students with uh, the robotics camps and uh, of course moving forward to digitize uh, or what they love uh, to call I mean, looking at the agriculture sector, I mean, and uh, the Ministry of Youth as well. Uh, they have, they had a platform like uh, the Youth Connect Africa, very big. Of course, started with the My ICT, but now since there are two different ministries, and sensitizing the at Wuhanzi Rwanda. I mean, looking at uh, talent development mostly. As the Ministry of uh, ICT and Innovation, what sort of programs? do you have right now to actually see that we're moving forward to a knowledge-based uh, economy. We're hoping to hit uh, the uh, ICT regional hub or even the African hub because we dream bigger. Mm -hmm. And even those big companies, even when they come to set up shop in Rwanda, they have market-ready employees. Mm -hmm. What does the ministry have in plans for this particular one? So on a couple of interventions, and it, you, you talked about Andela, and maybe I'll start off with Andela. <laughs> Andela is great. <laughs> because really, what Andela is coming in, I did mention earlier um, some of the industries that we have kept out mm -hmm. as a focus for the Kigali Innovation City. Yeah. A lot of these industries are heavily dependent on software developer skills, which is why a company like Andela that is coming in to build the Pan-African Software Development Hub mm -hmm. becomes a good fit for us because then they help us to build the critical mass of developers that we're looking for. Uh, but that's, again, that's not enough. And so what we're also doing is to say, and these are discussions that have already started, is to say, how do we redesign mm -hmm. the engineering curriculum so that beyond just Andela, when you go through the other higher learning institutions where they are private or public institutions, they're still able to churn out the quality of graduates that we're looking for. Very, uh, in, in, in February, one other thing that we've done is, um, we call it the Rwanda Coding Academy. It's something Rwanda. that is coming up yes. very soon that we're going to be launching. And what we're trying to do is, for those kind of students that, have, that are very passionate about coding, that are born to code, if once they're done with their, with their senior three living exams, and for them, they already know that my career path is in coding. I want to code. We're offering them a platform, like a bridge program, where they go through a three-year program, uh, A-level program, that is very strictly customized to uh, coding. And what it helps is that the kind of students that will come out of it either are ready to get onto the market and be employed or to create their own businesses, or if they choose to continue with a bachelor's degree, with a very, you know, or an undergraduate degree, they can still transition to that. And so it becomes like the, instead of the typical A-level type of three-year classes that you have to go through studying all these other subjects, you have something that is very specialized to people that are very passionate about coding. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do also is to say, 
we, we, we are working with a company called Dot Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we've created a program called the Digital Ambassadors Program. What we do is to look around, especially students from higher learning institutions, to say, how do you go back to the communities that you belong to and become our ambassadors to drive digital literacy, to create awareness about the potential role of technology and ICT in really uplifting people out of their poverty levels and making it you know, a better experience. And while we are doing that, uh, what we've decided is, let's partner with DotRwanda. Let's partner with likes like ICDL. ICDL, uh, the International Computer Driving License Program has, they call it a citizen program. They also have a public sector officials program, but these are like well-designed, internationally acceptable programs that take you a series of four, uh, through four modules that will help with really building digital literacy capabilities. Why are we doing that? Because we believe if we do this, then at the bottom of the pyramid, we create an appetite and then we start to see more and more numbers as we go higher up the pyramid and we start to churn out more graduates because you've started to expose people at an early stage bit in communities and schools to the potential of technology and to get excited about it and to choose it even as, a, you know, as part of their career path. And so these, there are quite a number of interventions that we're doing as we really think about um, you know, driving towards becoming a knowledge-based economy to say what are some of those partnerships that we can forge with the industry, with the academia, to really make sure that we're building the right talent and capabilities that will allow us to get the quality and quantity of uh, workforce that we're looking for. Mm -hmm.